Uh, why don't we pray? Let's pray first. Dear Heavenly Father, please, I just ask that this would be profitable and enter our hearts and that we would be more masculine, Lord. That we would be more manly and act like men, Lord. I need your help, Lord, um, that you would give me clarity of thought, Lord, um, that you would help give me the right words and freedom to say the right words. And um, please take my words and let it be profitable to my hearers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, Nurse says, would you maybe want to get the door if someone comes by? Yeah. If someone comes by. Yeah. Okay. So, we started a masculinity study about, I don't know when it was. Was it maybe a month ago? About a month ago we started one. And it's so important because scripture is full of commands that tell us to be uh, like men, act like men. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, you have David in his old age talking to his son, Solomon, father to a son. And he says these words to him. Um, he says, be strong and show yourself to be a man. That's, that's his last instruction to his son before he leaves. Uh, be strong and show yourself to be a man. And uh, what's up, guys? And uh, last study, to give a recap of last study, we went over to these verses that say, you know, be strong, act like man, and all those sorts of things. But we went into biblical examples of masculinity. And we were I asked you guys, who in the Bible, aside from the Lord Jesus Christ, is one of the most masculine men in the Bible? And what who did we talk about? Samson. Samson. John, John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Wow. We spoke about John the Baptist. Um, because John the Baptist is my favorite person in the Bible, aside from our Lord. Just such a hard man such a like would not be invited in any of these churches <laughs> he was the last person that any church would invite john in. and we spoke about whenever jesus was about to give a tribute to john he said these words what did you go out into the wilderness to see a man shaken by the wind a reed shaken by the wind no you know john's not easily wavered in his faith then he goes on to say, did you go to see a man dressed in soft clothing? In soft clothing. And the word for soft in that text, in the Greek, is a, a word we spoke about. It's malakos, which means effeminate. Effeminate. Malakos. And it's only used twice in the New Testament. So Jesus is saying... What did you go out into the wilderness to see? An effeminate man dressed in soft clothing? It's the word. That's what the word means. And he says, no. <laughs> John is a hard man. John is a man's man. John is a rugged man. And the only other time we hear the word malakos in the entire New Testament is in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, wherever Paul is listening, don't be deceived. The sexually immoral won't enter the kingdom of heaven. The swindlers won't enter the kingdom of heaven. The revilers, they won't. Men who practice homosexuality. And the King James Version, the NASB, and the Legacy Standard are the only translations, unfortunately, that mention the words, the effeminate will not enter the kingdom of God. And we spoke about what does it mean to be effeminate? Well, well, the only two places we have in scripture are that verse in John, when we spoke, not in, speaking about John the Baptist, and in 1 Corinthians 6 9. We spoke about how biblically effeminacy, what is, what is an effeminate man? It's a man who's straight, 
but they act contrary to their gender. And it's a sin as a man to act like a woman, to have womanish qualities. I'm not saying you cross dress, I'm not saying you completely go and dress like a woman, but you have a bunch of feminine, feminine qualities about you. <coughs> Needy, desperate, just weak, uh, fearful. So many, we, we got a whole list of stuff on there. And even if you want to think of a biblical example of a man who's effeminate, effeminate, effeminate clothing. Because that's the context of where Jesus used that word. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A man dressed in soft clothing, malachose clothing, effeminate clothing. So it can manifest in our clothing. Um, and how we just listed that effeminate qualities we need to crucify. Because... So many people just, oh, I'm not homosexual, I'm good. You can be straight and be in sin. You can be a straight man and be in sin. And it says that effeminate won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. Not because we, give, we go to heaven by being manly. No, it's saying if this consists of your life, you're a non-believer. You're a non-believer if your life is filled with feminine traits. It's sin. What we're going to talk about today is something that's very, I'm very passionate about. It's something the Lord saved me out of. We're going to speak about romantic interactions with women. Romantic interactions with women. Um, and we're going to bring forth the biblical masculinity and the you know, feminine things. What to avoid, what to do. Um, and what I mean by romantic interactions with people, I'm talking about if you're single and you're, you know, you want a wife, how do you go about that in a masculine way? If you're already in a relationship, how do you be the most masculine, godly boyfriend you can be? Or if you're married, how can you be the godly husband that you need to be in your marriage? Romantic interactions with women. We're not talking about the sister you have no interest for. Okay? And we all have this desire. Whether you're in one, married, doesn't matter. This is a study for all. It's funny, on, God, uh, on Friday, uh, God asked me a question. He's like, uh, you guys, are you going to teach us a game? <laughs> are you going to teach us? <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, That's risk. probably the <laughs> opposite of what my study today is for. Get Does anyone know what the red pill is? It's conservative and yeah. true. Yeah. What is the red pill? In regards to you know relationships, yeah, yeah. what is the red pill? Anyone heard of this? Yeah. Can anyone give a breakdown? Sure, what sure. It is? No, it's a traditional it's based value system where like the man does the manly gender roles and the female is a supporting character, and that uplifts the family that's how i would interpret it so do you guys know what movie the red pill is from matrix, matrix. so right. what happens in that movie it's a there's a you have a man right here um and then he, he has two pills in front of him the blue pill he goes back to reality he forgets everything he gets a red pill and he his eyes open to a knowledge that he didn't have before <coughs> okay and so basically basically in a worldly sense uh carnal uh red pill movement is basically this you take this you get you get some knowledge that how women work oh women are not this way they're like this so therefore i'm going to treat them this way now that's the that's the worldly red pill what we call um what's up brother um so that that that's that worldly red pill of you just have your eyes opened and then now because you have a certain knowledge of how the opposite gender works you treat them in a certain way. In the latter years, when I was unconverted, I was drenched in that. Drenched in that. And the Lord saved me out of that. You name it, manipulation. You name everything. Disrespecting a woman. Just treating them like garbage. But my purpose today of this study is to give a, a biblical viewpoint on gender roles. And let this be the Christian red pill so that our eyes can be open to true knowledge, 
biblical knowledge, biblical viewpoints on each gender, how they work. We're going to talk about biblical attraction. What is biblical attraction? How does that work? What is the source of it? Um, and the truth, may our minds be renewed by the truth. The truth. I want to talk about something that um, the world is so soft and weak and effeminate. And unfortunately, it's transferred over into the most sound churches. People who doctrine down, but spineless men. Spineless men. Just weak, effeminate. And um, I mean, all throughout music now, it's just lyrics of the most effeminate lyrics. Like, listen to these lyrics from this song. In my heart, I have but one desire, and that one is you. No other will do. I've lost all ambition for worldly acclaim. I just want to be the one you love. And with your admission that you feel the same, I'll have reached the goal I'm dreaming of. The world is filled with lyrics that are just pedestalize a woman and you go and you know just spineless uh, effeminate pursuits i want us to have a biblical viewpoint and we're going to be talking about uh, uh the type of effeminate people in the church actually um we're going to talk about the effeminate nice guy the effeminate nice guy i'm not speaking about kindness I'm not speaking about a kind man. And in fact, to, to make sure that there is no misrepresentation, I'm going to define what I mean uh, by a nice, a, a nice guy, a typical effeminate nice guy. Um, and so I'll write this down on the board so that we can get a, so we can just look at this and always have this as a reference so you guys know what I'm talking about. So what is a nice guy? He's a, a man um, who operates, and I'll explain this, according to the beliefs Did you use the blue one on purpose? <laughs> now it's red. Blue pill, red pill. Have you used that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, beliefs that if I do X, Y, Z, then I will receive X, Y, Z um, in return. And he is, a, I'll write this down as well, a man who consciously or unconsciously strives to do or say, um, Things to get another person's approval or avoid their disapproval. This is what I mean by the effeminate nice guy. And I'll read this as it. A man who operates according to the beliefs that if, this is important, this word, that if I do X, Y, Z, then um, I will receive X, Y, Z in return. He's a man who consciously or unconsciously strives to do or say things to get another person's approval or avoid their disapproval. I underlined two things here, if, then. 
if then the effeminate nice guy who they could be in the soundest church possible but they can be tainted with this their whole mentality and because we're having a study on romantic interactions when it comes to a girl they're interested in their girlfriend or their wife they have this mindset my wife was not happy today so that affects my confidence that affects my This, this, uh, I need her validation. Assurance. I need her assurance. I need her validation. So I'm going to do X, Y, Z so that I can get her approval back because I fear her disapproval. This is prevalent in so many, in so many ways. The if then mentality. And I assure you, it's been in every single one of us in this room. This is what I mean. Let's say there's a girl you're interested in. You walk her to her car after church but you walk her to her car with the purpose of I want her to like me I want her to be impressed by what I'm doing I want her to you know oh I just want her to you know feel the attraction that I want her to feel so I'm gonna do this so that I could get that someone who gives needy compliments one of the most effeminate qualities is neediness in a marriage Needy compliments. So, oh, she changed her hair. I'm gonna go and compliment her. So maybe she'll be attracted back to me. Hey, uh, I like your hair. I didn't get the response I wanted. You go further. Uh, it could be something as needy texts. Hey, just wanted to let you know that I'm grateful for you. Can I translate that? Please like me. Please like me. Hey, you did great today, by the way. Please like me. Like, translation is that. The heart, the intention behind that text is, I need you to fill a void in me. There's a void in me that a female validation, I want it to fill me. It can be the most minuscule things. Um, if I just, uh, maybe... You know, like let's say we're, we're, we're playing sports as a, as a church. Oh, she made a shot. Oh, let me give her a high five. And so maybe she'll like, you know, something, a bond can be created this way. And maybe I could get her to like me. Um, being agreeable. Uh, someone who is just... A woman says something, they really don't disagree with it. But because they want her approval, they'll just ingenuinely agree. Ingenuinely, they'll agree. Um, if she's... If she's sharing something that you disagree with, then kindly disagree. If she shares a song with you that you don't like, don't say you liked it when you really didn't. But the effeminate nice guy is just, well, I'm going to say that I, uh, I, like, I like that song so that we can maybe form a connection and maybe I can, you know, hopefully get her. In my unconverted days, here's an example. Way long ago, in my unconverted days, there was a girl I was talking to, and uh, there was a, just like a minuscule act that was done by her, and I'm like, okay, I want to seal this person's attraction. So I went and got flowers and a card for the most minuscule thing, not because there's anything wrong with that, not because there's anything wrong with getting flowers for a person. But the intention in which I did it was effeminate because I wanted her to fill a void in me by her liking me back. It was needy pursuit. Needy pursuit. The nice guy becomes what he thinks others want him to be and hides the things which they'll find displeasing. Nice guys jump into panic mode when they don't get the responses they want from the, let's say, the girl they're trying to impress, or their wife, or their girlfriend. Mm -hmm. But it's not just doing certain things. It's not just, let me walk her to her car, her, her car maybe she'll like me. It's also uh, not doing certain things because you want to avoid disapproval. So you don't act like how you normally act around that. You're just... It's clear, guys. It's evident. Not only can we feel it, but so can women.
It is someone who's just not acting themselves. Why? Because they're on this performance mindset that I, I, I want if then. If I do this, maybe she'll like me. Um, they withhold personal opinions or views because they fear that it'll um, that it'll turn them off some way. So I've been in this place multiple times where I, I, I've thought this. There's a girl I've had interest in, and I said <coughs> to myself, if I act like this, she'll leave me. If I text this way, she might lose attraction. If I, if, then. That's effeminate and needy. If I, if I talk like that, that might lower her attraction. Needy nice guys who idolize women. So the, this effeminate nice guy, it could be have the most sound doctrine. But this is something people don't talk about. This is something people don't talk about. Just not, it's just very hard to find things about this. The Christian nice guy puts the woman as the pedestal. The end goal, the end goal of his life. Really, like idolatry. Idolatry, it's a deep-seated idolatry. They pedestalize the woman. Consciously or unconsciously? I think another thing you've highlighted in all this too is that that individual has a lot of manipulation in their heart. The man? The, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you're calculating things mm -hmm. all the time. You're not being yourself. Just putting a mask on. Always putting a mask on, not being <clears throat> real. And let me tell you the truth. No woman is attracted to a man who puts them on a pedestal. That's the truth. Nothing turns a woman off faster than neediness. Lyrics like, I was sitting at work yesterday, I was just eating my lunch, and this most feminine song came on. It's like, something, lyrics like, how on earth could I ever live without you? Like, in like the most, how, I need you. You know, it's kind of ironic that you brought up lyrics because today in the car, the radio came on and it was a weekend song that said, I don't want to know if you're playing me, keep it on the low. And it just made me really angry. Like, what kind of cowardice <laughs> man would want that significant other to cheat on them and not tell them? Well, this, this is embraced in society. <laughs> this is embraced. I, it's, I think it's manipulative. I think it's the, like a snake that whispers in your ear. It's deceiving the woman to think they're effeminate, but rather they're trying to. I don't know. That's how I see it. When a man says those soft words, I'd be very careful if I was a woman. I think Satan is like increasing that in the world because, like, even rap used to be about like rap used to be like, in a sense, masculine in a worldly way, but it wasn't like this like simpy like chasing after girls. But like even rap now, like all these like soundcloud rappers and like these like juice world type like it's all sad songs about heartbreak and softness and like embracing your soft side like everything is like that now like, <laughs> embrace, em embrace your own dresses, uh, yeah yeah they all, they all dress like feminine it's, it's in music and you know what impacts us the most it's in movies so you see this played out like imaginary rom-com or romance something of this effeminate man being desperate, I can't live with that. The loser guy and like yeah, exalted woman. lose their life, and that I'm gonna I'm gonna make her mine. Like just this, like dropping everything, and the world this the world is, his world is this woman, and because this is so drenched in movies, music, it falls into the church, and people think this is normal. Well, how is you know how is Satan going to? What are the best avenues that he can use? to affect this world. It's media, right? It's media. It's media and uh, this false view that if I just do X, Y, Z, then I will receive X, Y, Z in return from the girl I like. A man who consciously or unconsciously strives to do or say things to get 
another person's approval or avoid this approval. He's a slave to people's opinions. He's a slave. Nice guys are afflicted with a deep neediness. They need to be filled up by other people and their opinions of them. They need to feel that female validation. So, we, rec we diagnosed our problem. How should a single young man, we're going to address the singles, and then we're going to go to all, okay? How should a single young man go about pursuing a godly woman? You go about it without any insecure neediness. No needy pursuit. No needy pursuit. But rather, you must lead with love. No needy pursuit, but you lead with love. What do I mean? I want us to draw some principles from the Gospels, the four Gospels. There's not really a place you go to in Scripture to talk about where can I go to see verses about dating. Really, there isn't really dating in the Bible because people would get married like that. But there's a principle I want us to look for in Christ. We are his bride and he is the bridegroom. When he came to earth, he was seeking a bride. And many of us here are single. We also desire to have a bride one day. So I just want to understand this relationship. He came to seek and to save the lost, his bride. Keep that mindset, keep this in the back of your head, that this was the closest thing. Well, I'm drawing principles out here. I'm not saying this is dating advice, but we're drawing out a principle here from Jesus' pursuit of his bride, because he's our model. And we have to pursue a bride like the Lord did. Let me say this. Jesus was the least insecure man to ever live. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes. He was the least needy man to ever live. And he was the most confident man to ever live. The most manly man to ever live. Whenever he was going to pursue his bride, he did not have a needy mindset whenever he went to get Peter, James, and John. And Andrew. In fact, he went up to them and said, Follow me. Follow me. Peter, Andrew, follow me. James, John, follow me. He goes to Matthew, right? We were listening this morning in our sermon. Matthew, follow me. That Those are the first words. That That's whenever he came to the point where this is my bride. This is the approach our Lord took. Follow me. Whenever, in all wisdom, I'm not teaching the second a girl comes in to church, you say, hey, follow me. <laughs> no. Whenever you find someone, in all wisdom, in all patience, you find someone you're interested in. Your pursuit is not, this is the prize, I got to break my back to get her. But rather, you love her by leading her with love. You love her and say, in all wisdom, okay? You, Jesus also initiated, right? That's another principle we can draw out. He was the initiator. So he came to his bride and said, I want you to follow me. And so it's, this is how a principle we can approach it. Not as a, mm, what words should I say so they hope she'll like me. Not that. Not that. You go not out of a sense of neediness. You go in a sense of security and confidence. And you say, hey, sister, uh, I'm interested in you. Uh, you're a godly woman. Um, yeah, I have feelings for you. Uh, 
I want to lead you to marriage. I want to, I want you to, I want you to follow me. I want you to be by my side. I want to take care. I want to pr provide and protect for you. Are you willing to follow me on this? If not, there's no problem with that. Kindness, love, but you're leading her with love. As a man, you're the leader. She's not. And so our pursuit must not be leaderless. It must not, your pursuit must not um, look like you're not a leader. But you're supposed to kindly, gently lead her in love. Since I'm a guy of analogies, something that just popped into my mind is, um, it's like having your hand be open mm -hmm. um, and allowing a bird to sit upon it. But not as soon as it sits upon it, you just grab it. You keep your hand open, and if she wants to leave, she'll leave. Yeah. And that wouldn't affect you at all, whether the bird stays or not. And Jesus' method, he said, follow me to a lot of people who are non-believers. Luke 9, he comes across three people whom he calls to salvation. And in fact, he says the same words in Luke 9. The three anonymous people. He says, follow me. Oh, I got to bury my father. Oh, uh, you know, I did this. I can't. So, in your pursuit of a godly woman, there will also be people who are not interested in you. Right? That's going to happen. That's going to happen. Where people are not going to be interested in you. They just, they, their feelings are not mutual. It happened with Christ. People didn't want him. Only a few, by the Holy Spirit's enablement, came to Christ. The rich young ruler, right? He came to Christ, left without eternal life. Jesus offered that invitation. People in Luke 9, the Pharisees, how many times did Jesus call them? Come, come, follow me. They didn't. So, our one principle is this. I love this story, and I've talked about it a lot recently. If we're drawing the principles out, let's say you go to a godly woman and they, uh, you tell them, hey, I'm interested in you. Uh, I, love, I, have, I have feelings for you and I really, I would want us to maybe start something. Um, but you get rejected. You get rejected. So how, what is the Christ-like way to respond? And I remember this, when I was a non-believer, if, if a woman rejected me, I, I got in the most petty moods of, you're lost. <laughs> you're, you're lost. Like, uh, all right, I'm gonna go flex with another girl on you. Like, all this petty, weak, weak. You got rejected and just blew your whole world. Oh, I'll show her. Just screw her. I don't need her. <laughs> Jesus was going to a Samaritan village, and the Samaritan village rejected him. We're not letting you come into our town. Because I know you're, you're headed to Jerusalem. And so, Jesus, whenever he's going into this Samaritan village, and he gets rejected. His disciples, James and John, are like the petty people I described. What do they do? What's their reaction? To rain down fire. They get so upset, Lord, let's call down fire and destroy them. <laughs> what a reaction. Literally. If that's the reaction of a man who can't handle rejection. They get all fussed up. Well, I'll show them. I'll show them. But what was Jesus' reaction when he got rejected? Calmly. Pull them aside. You don't know what spirit you are of. The Son of Man came to save, not to destroy. He rebuked them. So, we don't get fussed up in this whole... We are men. We can handle rejection. And we handle it gently, lovingly, not begrudgingly. Not begrudgingly. No. We handle it like Christ. He rebuked, he called out the people who were all fussed up. What do you think? What's the matter with you? Let's move on. Lovingly, gently. Go ahead. Yeah, um, MacArthur was teaching today out of Matthew 11, and that's where you have the unrepenting cities, and where Jesus says, um, uh, He says, You will descend to Hades, where the miracles occurred in Sodom, 
But you've heard he knew it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that, that it will be more tolerable for the Lamb of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. So he's saying that, addressing these cities where he did miracles, where he preached, etc., and they rejected him. Then he says, you know, to the Father, he says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Uh, for this was well pleasing in your sight. And, and so on and so forth. But you, you see this interaction there where, where Christ is saying, um, Father, in your will and your sovereignty, I've been rejected by these people. And it's good to you, so it's good to me. It's pleasing to you, it's pleasing to me. And, and if we are about our Father's business, we're to have that same heart. Okay, Lord, like by your will, this girl rejected me. That's obviously your plan. I'm going with the plan book, right? Yes, amen. Yeah, I, I, it's very important because sometimes we for, I forget that like God is for us. He's not against us. So he's not like, haha, loser. Like you got. He's like, no, that's not for you. Yeah, and I'll show you what is for you. Why? Like you should want what's from God and not, not from God because it's not gonna work out. Yeah, he's ultimately that rejection is leading you down the right path the way he has for you. Right? Yeah. He said, no, no, not that way. This way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to this quote. <clears throat> Jesus never once needed any female validation as a man. He was a rock-solid man, even if every woman on planet Earth did not want to be with him. Jesus never looked back thinking, Man, <clears throat> I lost some stuff by not having that person by my side. I would have been way better off if that person stood by my side now if they were still with me if the rich young ruler didn't I would have been way better if he was by my side <clears throat> he never needed any female validation ever ever but that's how we are we are I don't sit here claim that I have anything there that's why this is an important study for all of us man because iron sharpens iron in my weak spots you guys need to feel me your weak spots, vice versa, the same. Um, <clears throat> listen to this. Jesus pursues us by leading us. This is very important to understand. This is how Jesus pursued his bride. He pursued by uh, he pursues us by leading us. He loves us and knows what we need and sacrifices <laughs> himself to lead us into something better. He doesn't revolve around us but calls us to revolve around him. You see, he doesn't revolve around us believers, but he always calls us to revolve around him and his mission. And many times in his earthly ministry, he didn't spend time chasing those who weren't fully interested, but rather shares his own mission and expectations with them and calls them to come along for the ride because he loves them. Jesus didn't need Peter, James, John, Andrew, anyone. He didn't. He wanted them. He desired them. He loved them. He didn't need them. That should be the mindset, too, of any single man. I want her. I love her. I desire her. I don't need her. You know what Jesus said to those? After Peter, James, John, Andrew, they all came in the crew. You know what Jesus said to them? You, want, you, know, you know what's a good verse to show that Jesus was not a needy person? You know what's a really good verse? Are you guys going to leave too? All the disciples left. Many disciples left. And he looks at the twelve and says, Are you guys going to leave too? What was he really think? Do you let me let me ask you guys this? When Jesus said that, do you think he was saying that? Do you, do you think he said this? Are you guys going to leave too? Man, I hope these guys don't leave. <laughs> I don't know what all these guys leave. It was a test. We know it was. It's a test because we know the saints persevere until the end. Yes, we know that. But I'm telling you, I'm going into his heart when he said those words. There was no fraction of neediness. None. None. And we must pursue any godly woman never out of a needy heart. Never. Ever. Ever. And to those who are in relationships, you don't lead her with an insecure heart. You don't. You don't. Now I have to stop and say here. <clears throat> if I were to stop the study right here, 
an argument can be made that we would go home just as effeminate as we came here. If I stopped right here, in the, at this point in the study, whatever I have spoken thus far, I really believe cannot improve our masculinity. I'm, I'm firm on that. Everything I've said so far. Why do you guys think so? If you guys had to take a guess as to, so far from what I've said, I'm not saying you can't see improvement from if we end here, but why if we were to stop here? What I believe there would be very, to, very little improvement in biblical masculinity that's pleasing to God. Because we would have the same line of thinking of if then, so if I don't act needy, then I will win her approval. If I end the study here, you guys would have left with, all right, now I have better strategies to get the group. <laughs> yeah. It's still an if then mentality. It's still a, all right, now I'm gonna change it up. Now I'm gonna act different. But it's still an if then mentality. What's the difference if it's soft and effeminate versus it's, it's like you're uh, and Terminator. Macho man. You see what I'm saying? Let's turn, open up our Bibles to Proverbs 30. Hmm. Amen. You already know it. You or, already know it. Jordan's going to continue this study. Or to other things that destroy kings, king. Yes. <laughs> Amen. This guy knows the verse. Can someone read Proverbs 31, 2 to 3? And this, the book of, the, the Proverbs 31 is written from a mother to a son. This is a female's advice inspired by the Holy Spirit. You want to hear it from women? Listen to this. Someone read Proverbs 31, 2 through 3. Listen, my son. Listen, son of my womb. Listen, my son, the answer to my prayers. Do not spend your strength on women. Your vigor on those who ruin kings. And my translation says, do not give your excellence to women. Do not give your strength to women. The CSB says, do not spend your energy on women. What does this mean? What does this mean? It's a commandment to a man. It's a command to a man. If I left, if we stopped before getting here, you would have left going, oh, now I'm going to get it. But well, hold on, the mother says, wait up, you're a man. Your focus has to be elsewhere. Your focus, if, you're, if your end goal is a woman, you're in sin. Let's put it that way. If you're, right now, in your life, if your end goal is, I need to get a wife, and then, then that's my end goal, that's my chief, you're in sin. Let's hear some commentaries on this verse. Matthew Henry, the Puritan, says this. The man must not be soft and effeminate, nor spend that time in vain conversation with ladies with which should be spent in getting knowledge and dispatching business, nor employ that wit, which is the strength of the soul, in courting and complimenting them, which he should employ about the affairs of his government. Another sound writer, John Gill, says this. The strength of your mind, don't give the strength of your mind to woman, uh, which is impaired by conversation with such persons, or by time is consumed and lost, which should be spent in the improvement of knowledge. As single man, you burn with passion, right? Look what David Guzik says. The sense is that an excessive sexual interest in woman wastes a man's strength. This speaks of an unhealthy obsession with romance or sex, which should have a proper place in life, but should not be made into a reason for living. Jesus lived 33 years without sex. He doesn't need it. Neither do you. Okay? You don't need a wife. You can want one. You don't need one. You don't need sex. You can want it. You don't need it. You don't need it. Some people say, as can be observed in life, men have a tendency to be like puppy dogs with women they feel strongly about. 
What does this verse embody? Don't place your identity in woman. Don't make a woman your world. Don't let getting a girl be the end goal of your life. If a girl is your life, you're an effeminate, nice guy, and very feminine. Men were created for a higher purpose. 1 Corinthians 11, 9 says this, Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Amen? Mm -hmm. Neither was man created for woman. The male gender was not created for woman, but a woman for man. Men were not created for woman. Can I read uh, one verse out of Proverbs 5? Please. With what you're saying in 31. Please. Uh, Proverbs 5, 9 through 11, it says, um, Or you will give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one, and strangers will be filled with your strength, and your hard-earned goods will go to the house of an alien, and you're grown at your final end when your flesh and your body are consumed. It's in that context of giving to the women. Amen. Yeah, the Proverbs 5 woman. Yeah. The Proverbs 7 woman. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians eleven seven, For a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. And also, um, if a man seeks a wife, he seeks a good thing, but Paul yes. tells us that he would rather have us be stay single, you know, stay yeah, single. Yeah, his personal opinion. Seeking a wife is good. If it's the end goal of your life, you're in sin. This is what I'm saying, guys. I'm not telling people to get the gift of singleness. If that's what you live for, you're a distortion to your gender. I want to say this. I got to strongly warn here. Strongly, I have to warn here on something. You're now, you might be convicted of, man, I can't imagine all those effeminate things I've done. I can't imagine all those times I've just acted like a soft, weak man. You know, from now on, I'm not going to be that. I'm not going to be like that. I'm not going to tolerate that stuff. You go to the opposite spe spectrum and you become a jerk. You become cold. You become dry. You become rude. You become, you're like, you know, I'm not going to answer their text immediately. No, no. You know what's the problem with that? He's still this guy. Because now he's saying... I'm going to do the op opposite side so that I can get her approval. You're still the same effeminate guy. The same guy. You have to understand that. If your mindset after what I've been talking about is, all right, I'm not going to be soft anymore. I'm not going to be weak. I'm not going to... Good. But if you take this mindset away, all right, I'm going to be more up front. I'm going to be more direct. I'm going to be initiator. I'm going to be, I'm going to be you know, not so overly emotional. Because that'll get the woman effeminate, needy, if-then mentality. It doesn't matter. Notice how I, I said X, Y, Z. I didn't say a man who operates according to the beliefs that if I do soft things, then I will receive the girl in return. I said X, Y, Z. Because you can put whatever you want in there. You can put whatever you want in there. It could be, I'm going to lag on this girl. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to answer a text because that will create attraction. If then mentality, same needy mindset. Okay? Doesn't matter what you do. So do not fall on an opposite spectrum and think you've made it anywhere. Um, you're you're, you're going to talk about the solution to that, right? Yeah. Because I feel like yeah. what I'm about to say would be I don't want to. You'll add on later. If you okay. Want. Okay. So hold on to it. As long as uh, your goal is, I need to get the girl, everything you do will spring from a needy heart. If it doesn't matter what it is, if it's soft or you're a terminator, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So, solution. We did problem, the issue, we diagnosed it. We diagnosed, I warned you guys, don't fall on the opposite spectrum. Don't go to the opposite spectrum because it's still effeminate. Now, what's the solution? In Proverbs, it says, as a man thinks, so he is. The solution comes in our thinking. Effeminate people have a thinking problem. They've pedestalized a woman, so that's their thinking problem. 
They've put the woman in a place where she ought not to be in his, in his mind. As a man thinks, so he is. Our solution springs here, in the heart. So for us to be real masculine, godly men, what must our minds be fixed on? Two things. It's really one thing. It's really one thing. But the second manifests itself with the first. The mind of a masculine man is fixed on loving the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. All your mind. Did the verse not say all your mind? All of your mind. All your soul. All your heart has to be devoted to him. To him. And number two, that's number one, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Number two, we must focus on the mission that God has given us and love and glorify him through that. Every man here has a calling. Every man here has a mission. And you're supposed to glorify the Lord and love him through that. So it's really one, if we were to be very technical. You, your mind has to be fixed on Him. The two things, loving the Lord, and two, focusing on your mission as a man. Biblical masculinity, guys, is supposed to be here for God. It's for God. So if your eyes are on women and on yourself, but not on Christ, you've missed the entire point of this study. If you came here because you have no interest in God and you just want to be more masculine, I failed. Why do you want to be more masculine? If you want to be more masculine because you want to get girls better, you're this guy. Biblical masculinity grows in masculinity because he wants to please God. He wants to please the Lord. Listen to this amazing quote. If your entire pursuit of masculinity is based on trying to get something for a woman, your pursuit of masculinity is nothing more than a manipulative performance of boyish masquerading. Immature masculinity is living just for yourself. And the pursuit of your own pleasure forever and ever. The world has that. The world can have that. They, ha they already do that. You can find many books on masculinity by worldly authors. And they have no mention of God. They don't mention that our minds should be fixed on God, on loving Him. It should. That, it's not there. It's just not. God must govern our minds, not women. Christ must reign in the mind of a man. Not his crush, not his girlfriend, and neither his wife. Guys, did Jesus not say this? He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me he who loves his girlfriend more than me is not worthy of me he who loves his wife more than me is not worthy of me yes you're supposed to love your wife as christ loved the church but you're supposed to love christ more than your wife even your own wife even your own life if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters yes and even his own life cannot be my disciple our minds must love christ more than all the women in our life. Whether it's a mother, a girlfriend, a wife, or the, the girl you're interested in. He must reign so far in love that your love for that girl looks like hate in comparison to your love for Christ. You know why Jesus was the most manly man ever? Because 24-7 his mind was fixed on loving the Lord, his God, with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. That governed his mind 24-7. That's how Jesus was the least insecure man ever. He was sold on one purpose, loving God. Sell yourselves out to God. Throw yourselves in prayer. Throw yourselves in Bible reading. Throw yourselves in serving. Meditate on Him. Don't, you want to grow your love for God? Fix your mind with His love for you. The 
first focus is loving God, and the second is your mission. Each of us have a different mission in life. I want to be a pastor, if the Lord wills, and I want to go into real estate appraisal. Those are the two things the Lord has put on my heart. There's some people who want to be accountants. There's some people who um, want to be doctors. There's some here who might end up being janitors. There's nothing wrong with that. Restaurant owner. Our mission as a man has to be of greater focus than any woman in your life. Let's turn to Genesis 2. This is the last text we'll be on. Genesis 2. This is so important because I'm going to be wiring my argument in creation to show that biblically the male gender must have a mission, be committed to it, and be devoted to that over any woman. Genesis 2. 15 to 25. Can someone read that nice and slowly? Very slowly. This is in Genesis when God created Adam and Eve. This is where we understand the male and female gender. So please, someone read this loud and clear. Then, ye Boy. <laughs> <laughs> then Yahweh God took the man and set him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And Yahweh God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may surely eat. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat from it. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Then Yahweh God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground Yahweh God had formed every beast of the field, and every bird of the sky, and he brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place and Yahweh God fashioned the rib which he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man then the man said this one finally is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh this one shall be called woman because this one was taken out of man therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed God creates Adam first, and then Eve. And God gives Adam a mission. What's it, what's Adam's mission? Cultivate the land. To cultivate and keep the Garden of Eden. He gives the male gender, a man, a mission. Something to focus on. Something to do. Something to preoccupy his mind with. Something to love the Lord his God through that. That's his mission, to cultivate and keep the Garden of Eden. Notice this, guys. God gave Adam a vocational mission. A vocational calling. He didn't tell him to be a pastor of the church. <laughs> Not, the scripture says few people are called into the ministry. Uh, not many of you guys should become teachers. Um, can you open up room for me? You come sit over here, brother. Okay. Yeah. So, when God made Adam, um, he gave him a vocational calling to cultivate and keep the garden. This was long before there was any woman around. And he sets the male gender to glorify God through his personal mission. And then the woman comes afterwards. The order of these events are super important. This is what you guys need to understand. This. The order of these events are not by mistake. 
You think God could not have made Adam the same time he made? You think God could not have made Eve the same time he made Adam? But he didn't. He makes the man and says some words to the man. You're going to keep and cultivate this garden. That's your mission in life. This is what I'm calling you to do. And then Michael Foster says this from the book. Now, this is very, I'll be quoting from this book. It's by, as some people know, Doug Wilson's Camp of People, relearn.org. Good book on biblical masculinity. Really good. It's good to be a man. He says this, Michael Foster, God commissioned Adam first, then created Eve and brought her to him. What does God call the woman? A helper. Remember, this is of great significance. This is of such great significance to understand the female gender. You want to understand genders? Go to Genesis 2. Go to Genesis 2. Women are helpers by nature. They are helpers by creation. They are helpers by design. That's what God made the female gender to be. That's the first thing he calls the female gender. A helper. He literally made the female gender to help the man on his mission. We understand biblical attraction here too, guys. Because God created the female gender as a helper. So the female gender is naturally attracted to some male man set, devoted, focused on his mission. Mm. Why do you think women are attracted to success? Is it an accident? Sure, sorry. It's because the man was made to have a mission, cultivate it, and be excellent at what he does. I need to say something. The best compliment I have ever received in my entire life from the female gender. The, nothing beats this. I was uh, talking to somebody um, and uh, well, we were um, interested in one another, and uh, no nurses, no one, no one, no one. No, 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 no. yeah. um, let's give my mom a warm welcome. <laughs> this all shot happy birthday. Hello, Hi, Hello. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a person that I was talking to, uh, I think it was like 120 days, and um, I had to go. I was with her, I had to go, and you know, you know, woman, I was like, oh, don't go, please, like, who, you know, I, I'm gonna miss you, Can you please, uh, and you're like holding on to me, like, oh, I, I don't want you to go. Um, I don't know when, I don't know when this was. And then I said, no, I have to go and get work done. Do you know what she said? Yeah, I know. Uh, really, I do want you to go because I'm attracted to her. She's telling the truth by her design. Mm -hmm. If I was, if I acted effeminately, you know what I would have put my responsibilities aside, and you know, you know what I can't, I can't stay about five, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. So, right? I was firm on stuff, my responsibility that I had to get done. And she confessed, I find that attractive. I find that attractive that you're so focused on the things you need to do and get done that you're not sticking around. You just, you're, you're a man on a mission and you're sticking to that. It's the best compliment I've ever heard. Because it proves what I've been talking about. Um, the same way women are helpers by nature, Men are leaders by nature. So that's our natural creation design. So 
to men who idolize women, you're actually literally a distortion of the male gender. An utter distortion of the male gender. If you leave this saying, all right, I'm going to, man, Austin gave some really good insight on how I could you know, secure a wife. You're acting in a very distorted way to your own gender. Nothing wrong with seeking a wife, but if, this is what, I need to emphasize this, if that's your end goal, that's the problem. Not seeking a wife. Seeking a wife is good. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. But if that's your chief aim, you're in trouble. If we focus on women more than we focus on loving God, then we are a distortion to our gender. Um, we're reaching the end of this. Um, I want to understand. It's almost as if when God created Eve, brought her to Adam and said, by the way, this is your helper. This is your helper. It's almost as if God didn't want the first man to be an effeminate beta male. Listen up. This is your helper. Understand and see her as a helper. View her as a helper. She's your helper. She's not the prize. She's not the end goal. You see, even renewing your mind on what the female gender is, they don't become less in value because they're helpers. No. That's what God created them to be. Women are not supposed to complete you. They're supposed to complement you. Okay? Women are not supposed to complete you. They're supposed to complement you. Michael Foster says this. Since a wife is a complement to your mission, she cannot be the mission itself. A wife is not your mission, but a support to it. Adam ended up falling. But we have a perfect example. The Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. He's our perfect example. Listen to this story. Just listen. When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were eagerly seeking for him, and came to him, and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. It said the crowds came to him and were eagerly seeking for him. Let me, let me ask you this. Do you think there were a couple of attractive women in that crowd? I think so. It was the whole city's people. I think, there were, I think there would have been attractive women in that crowd. You know what he could have thought? Well, I know, those, those are days of, well, I could stop and, you know, there's a pretty woman out there. They're eagerly seeking me. We throw ourselves over women when they don't even seek us. When they show no interest back, we spill our minds over them. This guy, every, they were seeking, eagerly seeking him. Right? And guess what he says? I must go on preaching. Because that's my mission. And I'm devoted to that. I'm devoted to that. And he says, what happened? Kept on preaching. Kept on preaching. John 4.34 My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Our food has to be loving God and doing his will. The most manly men are people sold out for God. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jesus. So, I want us to think about this. What is the calling the Lord has given you? What's the mission in your life? Don't look for something spiritual. Vocational callings is what God gave the first man. Be devoted to that. Let me be aware of something. All right, I'm going to work. I'm going to work. I'm going to do, I'm going to just focus real hard. And while you're at work, you're really thinking about women. Give your mind towards the work that you do. Give your mind towards loving the Lord through that work. Don't be working and have your mind be somewhere else. Do all things to the glory of God. Um, yeah, in Colossians it says, uh, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as though working for the Lord rather than for human masters. Yeah. I was going to ask, um, when does work itself become an idol? Um, is it when you're, you're working and that's the end goal and it's not to glorify God? Why don't you keep, can you hold that question? Yeah. Yeah. We're almost done. I think we'll, sure. yeah, yeah, just hold.
hold that to make sure you remember that. Um, I just want to now, so study's done. I'm just going to read some quotes from here, okay? I'm going to read some quotes from this book. And I want us to listen, just listen to this. By the way, I'm going to be reading from, you know why I love this book? This whole book is about, you know, growing in masculinity. And the last chapter only talks about interactions with women and marriage. And they said we did that on purpose because that's not supposed to be the main focus of a man. That's not supposed to be the main focus. They, they literally said we leave it here last because you're supposed to get the other stuff down before you start thinking about this. You gotta be the right man first before you can worry about that stuff. Yeah, and they say it's a very good thing to find a wife but it's better to be a man first. <laughs> yeah, because that's it's a command. So listen to this. <clears throat> Women are attracted to men on a mission. <clears throat> when you make achieving the mission your mission, you are comparatively more likely to find a wife and achieve the mission. When you make achieving marriage your mission, you are less likely to find a wife and you will achieve very little else besides. Think of it this way. A woman is looking for a good leader. To lead, you must have a vision of where you are going, a mission that you're working toward. If your mission is no more than getting a wife, then where are you leading her? To herself? No sane holy woman would want to marry a man who's leading her to herself. Another quote. The more a man relies on his wife to validate his masculinity, the more his direction in life centers around her and the more needy of her he becomes the more needy a man is of a woman the less attractive he is to her neediness signals the opposite of dominion the opposite of responsibility and the opposite of authority and i love they say this you must chase excellence rather than woman you must chase excellence rather than woman so very practical for me in my mission, I, I, I want to preach. And so I strive that when I'm preaching, I'm preaching to an audience of one. And that I do my work in studying scripture for his glory alone. Pursue excellence in what God has called. Don't cut corners. Don't cut corners in where God has called you. Don't take a lazy way out. Embrace what he's given you. Work heartily as, as Messiah said in, in Colossians. You must chase excellence rather than woman. You especially cannot, you especially cannot become stuck on a single woman as the one you absolutely must marry. Isn't that gold? You cannot become stuck on a single woman as the one you absolutely must marry, and without whom you simply cannot be happy. Whether you get her, whether you get her or not, such a mindset will lead you into shipwreck. Anyone who thinks of their spouse as the other half that completes them is setting up their marriage for failure. No woman will ever complete you, neither will you complete her. Now, let's talk about the opposite then. Listen to this. It is normal and generally healthy to become attached to, dare we even say, a little smitten by an attractive woman which God places in your path. This is normal, guys. You see a godly woman? Oh, she's really pretty. She serves. <laughs> I'm not teaching to be a robot. Neither, neither does this book teach you to be a robot. So it acknowledges uh, it's normal that you, you know, you're like, oh, I like her. She's attractive. That's normal. But this is what they caution on. But it is also immensely easy in the modern day to become irrationally besotted. Besotted means strongly infatuated. If you're over the heels, oh, she makes me dizzy. She walks by. It warns against that. There's nothing wrong with being attracted to a woman. Nothing wrong. But it's when that leads to a strong, sensual, effeminate idolatry of who they are, that, that's the problem. The world says this, guys. There's a biblical reality that I want us to unpack. Girls, the female gender, are attracted to bad guys. The female gender is attracted to bad guys. And I'll unpack why. 
There's a biblical reason why. Nice guys finish last and jerks get the girl. Not because girls like jerks, but because they like men on a mission. It's not the jerk quality. <clears throat> it's not that. Don't become that. Don't become that. For Christ's sake, don't become that. Nice guys finish last and girls and, and jerks get the girl, not because girls like jerks, but because they like men on a mission. This is from the book, by the way. Nice guys put the girl on a pedestal, which means he demotes his mission in favor of her. The jerk doesn't. His independent drive supersedes her, and that attracts her. The takeaway isn't to be a jerk. I'm saying it, I'm pleading, and they're saying it as well. The takeaway isn't to be a jerk. Men should be kind humble but absolutely driven nothing can get in the way of the mission <coughs> this not only attracts potential spouses but also works as a filtering system so you'll go to a girl and say marrying me means joining my mission if you won't join then this won't work um, before I was unconverted I said how I was really drenched into you know, red pill like uh, this manipulating woman, being a jerk towards women. Um, and this is me. Um, nothing. <laughs> so let's, you have you have unconverted me right here. He was a jerk, rude, who would just act in manipulative ways, manipulate women. And that's unbiblical. But girls were attracted to me. Let me confess some sins here. I got converted and I was so sick of that guy. I was so sick of who that guy was that I said, forget all that. I don't want to even look like that person. And I had good intentions because there was evil in that guy. Evil, manipulation, rude, cruel things. But the problem was, I went to the other spectrum and I ended up becoming a soft, effeminate man who really had the if-then mentality. I'm just going to be nicer towards women. That's how I'm going to find my wife. I'm just going to if-then mentality captured this. I became this soft dude, soft, like spineless, like I didn't attract women the same way as the believer versus the unbeliever. And I'm like, there has to be something wrong here. Now, I want us to be, throw away the bad qualities of the unconverted guy, throw away the bad qualities of this guy, and we're supposed to meet in the middle. What's the middle? The first guy, do you know why girls were attracted to me? Because I didn't make them my world. Throw away everything else. Rude, manipulative, throw all that away. Keep that. Didn't make a woman his world. This guy did. This guy did. The new, when I got converted, that, that, I made a woman in my world. I, I want a marriage, and I'm, I'm going to get her from being nice and being, doing nice things because I would want her to feel me. Throw the effeminacy away. Throw the cr cruel thing away. What we want is the ideal man who loves the Lord as God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, does not make woman his world. But he's kind to them because that's what loving the Lord your God is. Right? How can you love God and treat women like garbage? How can you? How can you say you love God and go on manipulating them? How can you? What does First John say? If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. You have to be gentle with women. Why? Because God commands you to be. Our, our, as men, we're supposed to focus on loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then you would be concerned with gentleness. You would be concerned with gentleness towards women. You would be concerned with kindness. You would walk them to their car because that's the right thing to do. You would encourage them in the faith, not because you're trying to get something back from them, because that's good. Encouragement is good. 
have to emphasize this. Don't fall on either spectrum. Devote your mind towards loving God and obeying Him. And that would manifest manifest itself that would manifest a certain in a certain way towards one. If you're a jerk towards them, you don't love God. You're not loving them properly. You're concerned with yourself. Yourself. So that's what we're uh, gonna close off with. The takeaway is this. If you take away from this, now I got better game to be with women. I have failed, and uh, you misheard what I've been saying. You have to truly sell yourself out for loving God and obeying Him to greater heights. Look at your own life and see what areas can I improve in and do it. And commit yourself to that. Let's close off in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Holy Bridegroom, all glory belongs to you. All glory belongs to you. Um, be glorified by this. Raise a generation of loving men, loving fathers. And please bless the rest of this time that we have together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So